Bart has always been absolutely amazing. He, he put our family on the map, gave us all the start that we needed, um, helped many, many, many people who needed and were battling and suffering and he's asked nothing in return. For the racing public in, in, in those years to have been exposed to Barty, I think they gained tremendous pleasure out of him. It goes back a hell of a long way. It was in my formative years of following racing, back in 1979, I used to always take a chance on Barty Leisha, mainly because he was just the type of guy that would always ride to win. It was primarily the reason why I'm in racing today, because it's people like that that made the game just what it, it was then and what it is now. I mean, I would do it all again. I love horses, I love outdoors, and I love everything but the falling, the accidents. That is heavy. Uh, to overcome, to come back from all those accidents, that is big time. You've got to have more than, you've got to have more than courage. He was more popular than the Beatles in Hong Kong. We used to walk down the street, Mr. Loishin, Loishin, the, 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 the crowds. That's how popular Bart he was with the people. He was the people's jockey. At 26, Bart Elisha became the first South African ever to win an international jockey championship. In 1988, he dethroned the legendary Tony Cruz to take the Hong Kong Jockey Championship for that year. Barty Leisha, one of nine siblings born and raised in Mayfair, Johannesburg, had never seen a horse in the flesh until the day he arrived at the academy at age 14 in 1976. Barty was one of the last apprentices to finish his qualifying rides, which was very disappointing at the time, you know, because we all had these great ideas. And, but uh, ultimately, uh, it worked out. Now, when he was ready, uh, he started showing up. As an apprentice to John Nicholson, um, his potential started to, to show. It took a while be before Barty was uh, actually given some good rides by John, but on every occasion when he did give Barty the bottom weights, which incidentally at that time was 48, if you claimed two and a half, you could ride 45 and a half. And uh, Barty uh, then started to shine and, and the, the public started noticing him then. One of the jockeys that consistently came up was Barty Leisha, mainly because he was just the type of guy that would always ride to win. And I fondly remember my biggest winnings ever in horse racing were because of Barty. There's nothing you can do it's in your favour not to win. That's my way of thinking. You win, collect your cheque, that's what you work for. And the people, they put in their money on, I mean, ride for them. You're not riding for yourself. Ride for the people that always ride for the people, for the public. I mean, let them win money. They come home with money for their families. Everybody's happy, why must they go to races and lose? I said, no, that's not right. Let them come home winning. That aspect was very, very special with Barty. And it got him into trouble sometimes, but it never, ever deterred him from riding to win. And that made him very, very special in the eyes of the racing public. You know, They knew their bottom dollar, their desperation uh, money could be wagered on him. And yeah, if, if you lost well, you knew you had a fair chance. And if you, if you won well, you would go home with more grocery money or whatever it is at the time. My father, being a very staunch Catholic and, and, and God-fearing, realized that our name was all that we really had at the time. And uh, that at all costs, the name had to be preserved and your honor and integrity as a person had to be preserved. And. Uh, that was installed not only in all of us, but particularly in Barty, where he knew that at that particular time in racing, um, there was a tendency 
for a lot of the guys not to try at a particular time and when it was right to try. I mean, it was a known thing. Guys gave horses runs and Barty couldn't give a horse a run. No matter if it, if it was a thousand meters and it was a stayer, he would ride to win. And that's what, that, that will to win was something very special that uh, Barty had. And I think that, that made him special amongst, above all others, you know. Daddy, Daddy said, uh, don't ever do it. If you do it once, then you always have to do it. So don't ever, don't ever cook. Now the way he spoke to me that day, he said, don't do it once. So I never, I never ever did it once. I was offered a lot. That's not funny. But I was offered a lot to, to cook one or two horses. But I never ever did. And uh, I never ever did. Riding to win, Barty Leisha landed his first big race feature on Lagan in September 1979. Carrying bottom weight, he took the John Skeeping Trophy over 1,800 metres at Turfentain, start to finish by 11 lengths. He had an amazing knack of doing that and, you know, everyone thought, well, well this is the only way he could ride because he, he would go to the front, balance the horse, give it a breather at the top of the stretch, it would relax a little bit, change legs, and suddenly it would take off again at the 4-500 and, and keep going without horses catching him. By 1982, Barty was ready for the big one, the Rothmans Durban July. His ride was Sweet Wonder, owned by family friend Butch Tawil and trained by Bertie Sage. In preparation, they took the Republic Day handicap, run over the gravel 1,900 metres. The plan was coming together, and Barty was confident he could take the July. Many, many millions were going to be won. Butch the wheel and our family, and uh, we'd already, with the trainer, already booked the Elangeni ground floor out. This is where our celebration party was going to be. And uh, we were super confident. I mean, we really were. Um, in fact, Bertie Sage slept in Sweet Wonder's stable the night before because we were worried that somebody would get to it. I mean, it shortened actually to 10 to 1 the day before the July. On the day of the July, he actually shortened to 7 to 1 and uh, Barty came from behind. I uh, took a bump in the beginning, came from last and uh, 20 or 30 meters before the line he joined issue head to head with Jamaican Rumba. Paddy Wynn was in front, he had gone uh, pull clear. And uh, we were in the, the top of the grandstands at Gravel and the way he came at uh, Jamaican Rumba we, we thought we home. We were going crazy there and three or four strides before the line Sweet Wonder decides to savage Jamaican rumba, something I've never seen in a race. That's how he lost the race. He lost by a short head and, uh, yeah, well, we, we attended a funeral <laughs> at uh, the Elangeni. We all sat around, there was a little uh, uh, soft music going and we were all in mourning. But great fun, you know, when you think back, it was quite amazing, you know, really something special, yeah. Sweet Wonder was one of the, the unsung heroes of his day. But not so for Barty Leisha. In 1984, his talent and dedication were officially acknowledged. At 23, he became the youngest South African jockey to be awarded Springbok colors. Then it hit me that I am a Springbok. I was uh, the youngest Springbok, the youngest Springbok jockey ever. So that's history. In 1985, the accolade was repeated. It was a good year. Barty took the Transvaal Jockey Championship with 117 wins, smashing Gerald Turner's long-standing record for the most winners in the season for the Transvaal. And then came 1986. Barty was offered the ride on the least fancied of trainer Terence Millard's trio, Occult, in the upcoming Durban July Handicap. In gallops, I never ever won a gallop. Of course, we're all from the same stable. 
Full Sum used to win the Gallop by about six or eight lengths. Then in Chanting Garden, it was four lengths in front of me. So it used to be like that. Fool's Home at 7 to 10 to win the July would have been the shortest July favourite in history, if I'm not mistaken. Um, there was nothing around that could work with or beat Fool's Home. First, I had to lose the weight. That was a mission. I lost, I think, eight k's in a month. And Mark Sutherland had chosen one of the greatest fillies in the country, Enchanted Garden. She would race with the guys and she would beat them regularly. And Barty was left with a Colter B Division horse. I worked Fool's Home once. Just once, on my own. So after the, after the winning post, I come to ease him up just to, I mean work's finished, so I come to ease him up and I pull his head sort of in and he just stops from, from cantering to a walk. I said to one of the grooms, what's wrong here? So he went like this. No, no, I mean, like I say, looking and listening. So that means the horse has got a th throat problem. So that was my first plan, just to make him do that in a race, gently, enough for him to choke up and ease off. Can't see the delay, they running for the gold in the Rothmans July. So I jumped out very quick, immediately straight to the front. Now the pressure's still on, but it's not really pressure because I've been working those. I know the horse, I know Fool's Home's problem, and, and I know that Enchanted Garden is a filly. Fillies don't like to get bumped in a race, and the July's a rough race. And it's Occult, now the leader by one length. Voodoo Charm is running second on the outside of that. And I worked out that by slowing down the pace gently, Fool's Home's going to choke up, and then the whole field's going to cramp, and then Enchanted Garden's going to get bumped. So now I've done Fool's Home gently, that's all I all he needed and then when I hear the rest of the field screaming from behind, I know that there's a lot of bumping happening. So I said well that's definitely enchanted garden getting bumped. Behind that one we find fair value just on the inside, Brubaker and Yamani then full charge. 200 to run. Fool's Home had moved on my inside to put his run in. I knew it was him. Full zone gets the green light and coming forward now. And then model man put his run on the outside. So I give a colt one smack. I mean, I have to. You can't lose the July <laughs> because you never get the smack. And, and he actually gave me. You know, when you actually sort of, you know, in, in the car when you put foot and you give. So I felt that. I said, whoa. Now this is petal. Occult and Fool's Arm running for the wire. Fool's Arm, Occult on the inside, Model Man on the outside. Occult and Fool's Arm, but the transfer rider, Barty Leash has done it on Occult. As you can pass the post, that's when the July's one. That's when you're not sitting on that horse anymore. You're not. I don't know where you are, but you're not on that horse. <laughs> and yeah, it was really probably the highlight of Barty's career. I mean, he was flying for a month, six weeks after that, he didn't come down, yeah. That was something else because <coughs> it takes you a long time to come back because after losing that amount of weight, I went to the doctor in the, in the chuck room. I'm sure he must have put me on a drip or something because I was finished. I mean, that race, if you had to run it again 10 times, I think Fool's Home would have won nine out of the 10, yeah. And he rode a classic race party. Like the course record, that beats uh, Mesrin and yet against Thumbs. That sang a lot. Beating those horses' Thumbs. Beating Sea Cottage's Thumbs. That's a lot of sand. That is a lot of sand. And then history again. Terence Millard, first, second and third in the July. On such a high, there was no stopping Barty. 1986 became a year to remember. Two months after the July, 
at Turfentain Barty Leisha Road, six winners on the day. This included Jungle Rock in the champion stakes. At the very next meeting, Barty brought home four winners at the Val. Three days later, back at Turfentain, he rode another four winners. 14 winners in eight days. South Africa today, tomorrow the world. 1987, with Barty riding at his best, the door opened to the world stage.